We continue to worship and glorify our Heavenly Father this morning through the proclamation of His Word. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to Luke chapter 12. If you don't have one with you, there should be one in the seat back pocket in front of you or perhaps it's behind you. As you are turning to Luke chapter 12, I would like to welcome any guests or visitors who are with us. We are so glad that you have joined us for worship this morning. We'd like to let you know that it's our general practice here at Church of the Resurrection to look at whole books of the Bible one at a time and to walk through them section by section, verse by verse, thought by thought. It is our hope and prayer that by doing this, by by looking at the whole counsel of God's word, that our God would be pleased to reveal himself to us, that he would, as we have just sung, that he would speak to us through his holy word. And so we are in Luke chapter 12 this morning. We'll be looking at verses 13 through 34, because last week we were in Luke chapter 12, looking at verses 1 through 12. And next time we're in Luke, we'll be looking at the next section beginning at verse 35 as we walk our way through this glorious book. For those who are members or regular attenders, we'd like to encourage you to be reading through the Gospel of Luke throughout the week, maybe even during your family devotion time, your family worship time, so that as we gather together on the Lord's Day, you will be reminded of where we have been, you will know where we are, and you will know where we are headed in this glorious book kind of gives you an idea of the overall context. One of the great things about preaching through books of the Bible, as we'll see this morning, is we get to make allusions and references to where we've been, and you get to remember, oh yeah, I remember when we when we were there and we saw Jesus say that, or or when the disciples did this or that. When as you're reading through it throughout the week, you'll also be reminded of that as well. Well, before we read God's word and hear what he has in it for us this morning, let's go to him in prayer, asking him to bless the reading and proclamation of his word. Please bow your heads and your hearts with me as we go before the throne of grace. Our great God, we come to you asking that through your word this morning, you would speak to us, your people that we would hear from our Father. Lord, we are humbled that you have not only created us, but Lord, in your great grace, in your infinite mercy, you have also condescended to us through the pages of Holy Scripture, which are your very words. They have been inspired. They are your breath. And so, Lord, we ask as we read your word this morning, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would make them come alive for us. For Lord, we are not handling any ordinary book this morning. Lord, the difference between this book and every other book is the difference between us and dirt. And that difference is the breath of the Holy Spirit is in them. Lord, for we know that when you formed us from the dust of the earth, you breathe life into us by your spirit. So too, when these words were penned, you inspired them, you breathe life into them so that they are your very words to us. Lord, help us to listen carefully this morning. Help us to have any distractions from our daily lives, our our worldly endeavors be removed from us. Give us clarity of thought. Help us to pay attention Help these words to not only land in our minds, but to land in our hearts and to move our feet so that we are transformed by the renewing of our minds through your word and that this is all done to your glory, that you will help us, as we will see this morning, not to be anxious for anything, but that you would help us to seek your kingdom, the kingdom of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and that, Lord, through that kingdom, you would add all that we need to us. And so, Lord, we come to you asking that you would do this for our good and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're looking at Luke chapter 12, beginning at verse 13, going down to verse 34. I ask that you would listen carefully as we read God's word aloud for us and that you would follow along in God's word. Luke 
chapter 12, beginning at verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbiter over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And he said to his disciples, Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, about what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn. But yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory will not array, was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothed the grass, the grass which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old. With a treasure in heaven that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The grass withers and the flowers may fall, but the word of our living God, it will stand forever and ever. Thanks be to God for his word. Well, brothers and sisters, last week in Luke's gospel, as you may recall, we saw Jesus followed his strong denouncement of the scribes and the Pharisees by turning to his followers and telling them not to follow the example set by the Jewish religious leaders. Remember, he, he said they were hypocrites and that their hypocrisy would spread like, like leaven does through bread. The reason Jesus gave for his followers not to be hypocritical is that they need to trust in and fear God. 
Because he is the one who has authority over their eternal destiny. You remember he said, he is the one who can cast you into hell. If an individual is concerned more with pleasing people instead of being concerned with pleasing God, the danger of hypocrisy is standing at their doorstep. Because of this, Jesus' disciples, you and I, need to fear God and confess him before others. So Jesus will confess us, confess his followers before the heavenly host. That's what we saw last time. In our passage this morning, Jesus turns from the disciples' need to trust in God in the midst of persecution. He turns from that to demonstrate the obstacles that money, that material possessions pose for those who are seeking the kingdom of God. In this warning that we have in our passage this morning, Jesus tells a parable to illustrate the danger of placing your trust in your possessions instead of placing your trust in God. Then Jesus moves on to continue to discuss trust with his disciples. Particularly, we will see Jesus highlights how his disciples should trust God for daily provisions. In highlighting our need to trust in God, Jesus shows how anxiety gets in the way of our ability to trust fully in God. When we fully trust in God, when we trust in what Christ has done for us, we are enabled, we are made able to not hold on to earthly possessions so tightly that we are then able to freely give to the work God is doing here and now through his kingdom, through his church. One noted New Testament scholar has summarized our passage this morning well with these words. Fools do not take into account the inevitability of death in planning how to use wisely and properly their possessions, which are gifts from God, so as to please God rather than themselves. End quote. So with this introduction and this summary in mind for us this morning, as we walk through God's word together this morning, there are two things that I would like to highlight in God's word for us, two things that I would like us to see in God's word this morning. First, we will describe treasure on earth, and second, we will discuss treasure in heaven, treasure on earth and treasure in heaven. Let's look at each of these points in turn. First, we see treasure on earth. We see that in verses 13 through 21 of our passage this morning. Through verses 13 through, excuse me, through 20, yeah, through 21 of our passage this morning. Our passage begins with an unnamed man in the crowd kind of changing the topic of where Jesus has been. As you might recall from last week, Jesus was warning his disciples not to fear man, but to fear God. And kind of in the middle of this, we have a man who kind of shouts out from the crowd in verse 13 of our passage. This unnamed man wants Jesus to settle a dispute he is having with his brother concerning the inheritance left to them by their father. Inheritance disputes were common during the life of of Jesus during this time period. This is due to the fact that wealth was more likely to be inherited during this time than earned. Notice in this man's request the insistence he has on how Jesus is to render judgment in this supposed case he is bringing to him. He doesn't simply say there is a dispute and they would like Jesus to be the arbiter of this dispute, that they want Jesus to settle it. But, but notice what he says. He tells Jesus how he is to render that judgment. Tell my brother he needs to give me part of the inheritance. He's telling him from the beginning how he is to cast judgment. Verse 13. I'm often blown away as we read through the Gospels and hear how people respond to the things that Jesus says 
Imagine being in the crowd and hearing Jesus speak about how we are to fear God and put him first in all that we do. And then in the middle of Jesus speaking, someone in the crowd shouts out, tell my brother to give me money. I, I just, where did these people come up with this stuff? I, I don't know. Thankfully, nobody shouts out in the middle of my sermons, so maybe the occasional amen, but, but I, I, I wouldn't even know what to do with these sorts of things. It is almost as if this man was not listening to anything Jesus had been saying. It's almost like he's been saying, I've had my fingers in my ears going la, 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 waiting for a moment, boom, Jesus, I need you, fix this. In verse 14, Jesus does not do as the man asked. Jesus does not want to get involved in the civil affairs, but instead he wants to remain focused, as you will see in what he says, he wants to remain focused on the kingdom of God. And we know that by, by how he responds to this man's questions. There are many in the church today who insist Jesus must get involved in all areas of politics. But here we see this was not Jesus' approach. He was asked by this man to be a judge. And he responds, who made me a judge or arbiter over you? As if to say, this is not my role. This is not my place. This is not why I am here. I am not here to get involved in these sorts of issues. Jesus' role is not in the political or the civic sphere. When he was standing in front of Pilate, he said, if I was here to overthrow you, I could call down angels and they would come and we would wipe you out. That's not why I'm here. That's what he's saying to this man. As the Apostle Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. For I decided to know nothing among you except. So Paul is writing to the church. He says, I, there's nothing that I know except one thing. He goes on to say, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul recognized Jesus' mission was a spiritual mission to bring the kingdom of God through his death and resurrection. So he followed Jesus' example to bring nothing except Jesus and his atoning work. The church today should follow not only Paul's example, but more importantly, in our passage, Jesus' example here in Luke 12. And the church today should proclaim the kingdom of God brought about through the saving work of God's only son, Jesus. If you've come here for any length of time, hopefully, I pray that you know at least this much is true of me. When I stand here before you each week, I claim to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified as declared in the scriptures. One of my favorite bands from high school has a line in one of their songs that says, if we ain't preaching Christ, we ain't preaching nothing. Pardon the bad grammar there. But if I'm not preaching Christ, I have nothing to give you. I stand before you and I claim to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Verse 15 makes it clear Jesus' focus stays on the kingdom of God. He doesn't get distracted. He doesn't get lured away to do this. Makes it clear when he warns his disciples against greed and its danger. He tells them that they ought to take care and be on guard against all covetousness because life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. He takes the man's question and he says, I hear you, I'm not a judge, but you know what all you need to do is to be on guard against greed. Somewhat implying, backhandedly almost, that this man may have been greedy in what he was asking for. It doesn't say that explicitly, but that may be what's there. 
Jesus uses this man's question to warn of the dangers found in excessive care regarding material possessions. He, he, he takes this guy's request for Jesus to be an arbiter and he says, be on guard. Be careful. Money can grab a hold of you very quickly. The warning here is not just against money in general, but against all forms of greed. The Greek word used here, translated as covetousness in the English Standard Version, which I read from, means the desire to always have more. I'm sure that most of you have an individual like this in your life. There's someone in my life that's close to me. That, that this phrase, the desire to always have more, is endematic of their life. Their life is the pursuit of, of one thing to the next thing to the next thing. And they think, if I just get this next thing, this, this house, this new car, or if I, if I just go on this vacation, or if I just have this, this new thing, then when I get that, then I will be happy. And they might be happy for a couple days. And they're already on to the next thing. What do I want? What do I need next that's going to make me happy? It's what Jesus is warning against here. One of the main pitfalls found in greed is it can distort our priorities. It can cause us to overvalue possessions instead of people. It can cause us to care more about things than others. As one commentator rightfully notes, greed can create a distortion about what life is because the definition of life is not found in objects but relationships, especially to God and his will. To define life in terms of things is the ultimate reversal of the creature serving the creation, and ignoring the creator. End quote. Don't, don't miss that. When, when we are greedy, when we are covetousness, we are, we are doing the ultimate reversal, and the creature is serving the creation and ignoring the creator. This is exactly what Paul says in Romans chapter 1, when he says, therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. When we are greedy, when we are covetousness, when we, when we are covetous, it causes us to, to flip the, the priorities, to flip the roles, and to care more about creation, about things we can get, than about relationships with one another. And most importantly, as we see in our passage this morning, our relationship with our Creator. In all of this, notice how Jesus takes this man's request to get involved in the political sphere, in the civic sphere, and turns it to a matter of the heart. He turns it back to the kingdom of God. To further underscore his point and to illustrate what he is saying, Jesus tells a parable here, a parable that is often known as the rich fool. As we've been going through Luke, we've seen a number of parables, and every time we get to the parables, I remind you of a key interpretive principle for the parables. I remind you that, that when we are examining the parables, we do not try to find a parallel with every single point within the parable, but instead we are to look for the single overarching spiritual theological point being made, the one that Jesus is making in this parable. So for example, this morning, it would be wrong for us to look and say, oh, this man tore down his barns and built larger barns. Oh, those barns correspond to fill in the blank. 
And somehow we need to then not tear those down and build bigger ones in their place or something to the like. We're not to do that. We are to look at the overarching, singular, theological point being made. The point of this parable is not that it is foolish to save and to store up what you have. Here, very clearly, that is not the point. The point here is not, do not save. That is not the point. But rather, this man stored up what he had and then relaxed, ate, drank, and was merry. Verse 19. It wasn't the fact that he stored up that was the problem. It was once he had it stored up, what did he do? As we would call it today, he retired. He said, I'm going to live off of the fat of the land and I'm going to do nothing. I've done it all and I'm doing nothing. This man is foolish, in other words, because he found his significance and joy in his earthly treasures. Because I've got a lot in the bank... I can coast and take it easy. Because of my money, I'm good. That was his problem. This is why God calls this man a fool in verse 20. Because after he had everything stored up, he was not ready for death. He had not planned for death. He had not cared about his relationship with his creator. It says his soul was required of him. That is, it's time for him to die. And he had no one to give his stuff to. Jesus makes the meaning of this parable crystal clear for us in verse 21. Look at what he says. When he says the problem was this man laid up treasure for himself, while at the same time he was not rich towards God. The problem wasn't that he stored up. The problem was that while he stored up, he also neglected the more important things, the weightier matters. The problem was he stored up his treasure while also ignoring his relationship with God. And in fact, there seems to be a connection between him storing up and him neglecting his relationship with God. This is what greed and all kinds of covetousness can cause you to do as well. It can cause you to care about earthly treasure to the exclusion of the more important realities. So Jesus is warning us here this morning as we've looked at earthly treasure or treasure on earth. When we love treasure on earth, we neglect more important aspects of our existence. And ultimately it causes us to neglect our relationship to and commitment with God. So we go on to our second point this morning, treasure in heaven. If we're not to have treasure on earth, where are we to have it? We are to have treasure in heaven. And we see that in verses 22 through 34 of our passage this morning. Jesus furthers his thought in verse 22 to his disciples. Notice that he begins by saying, therefore, in verse 22, he says, therefore I tell you. An old Bible study trick that I heard a long time ago is that whenever you see a therefore, you need to ask, what is it there for? This therefore is telling us what I just said is connected to what I'm about to say. I'm drawing a conclusion for you guys here. He's drawing a conclusion from what he has just said. In light of his warning against greed, Jesus tells his disciples not to be anxious about their lives, particularly what they will eat, and not to be anxious about their bodies, particularly what they will wear. He says, when you have an inordinate amount of greed and covetousness, it causes you to become anxious, anxious about Where are you going to get food? Or what are you going to eat? And what are you going to wear? It's mind-blowing how diagnostic Jesus is here of our current culture. When we think of the rich and the famous, I know most of you are too young to remember the TV show 
with um, the gentleman who went into the, the house of all the, the rich people, lifestyles of the rich and famous. But when we go and we look at the rich and the famous, how, how are they designating themselves as rich and famous? By what they're wearing. By where they're able to go and dine. You, you can't get a reservation where I'm going. You can't get in because you're not wearing the right clothing. Right? Jesus so puts his finger on exactly where it is. Now Jesus is not saying here, That having our daily needs met is unimportant. Remember back to the beginning of chapter 11, and I alluded to this earlier. This is great getting to walk through books. We get to remember. What what did he say back in chapter 11 when he gave us what is known as the Lord's Prayer? He told us to pray for our daily bread. He told us to pray for our daily needs. So he's not now here saying, that's unimportant. It's not what he's saying. Instead, what he's saying here is we need to be warned about the tyranny of things, the tyranny of stuff. That's what he's warning against. He's not saying, don't don't get up in the morning and say, hey, honey, what's for dinner? He's saying, be careful that food doesn't grab a hold of your heart. Be careful that stuff, your clothing, doesn't grab a hold of your heart. When we pray for our daily bread, our daily needs, we are enabled to no longer worry and be anxious about having what we need because we are taking it from us and saying, God, I'm putting this in your hands. You're going to take care of that. I'm not going to worry about that. I've prayed, I've asked you to give it, and I know that you are good and you will provide. That's in your hands now. And we know that when we do this, we are placing our needs into the hands of a loving and a good father who is in heaven. We saw this a few weeks back. In verse 23, Jesus once again reminds us, life is more than just food. Life is more than just our bodies. Life is more than just our clothing. As an illustration, Jesus uses the raven in verse 24. He says, consider the raven. Think about the raven. The raven doesn't work. They don't store up in barns. They don't have storehouses for their food, but they still eat. God still takes care of them. And how much more important are you than a raven? You are much, much more valuable than the birds, and God takes care of them. How much more then will he take care of you? With this illustration in place, Jesus then moves to a practical objection to show the uselessness of anxiety. He asks the rhetorical question, a a question that kind of the answer's in the question. He says, which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? How often have you worried, and because of your worrying, you have gained time here on earth? The answer, no one. No one has ever done that. No one has ever been anxious and afterwards said, oh good, I've added days to my life because I was anxious. No one can add a single hour, a single minute, a single second to their lives by being anxious. In fact, the irony is anxiety and stress can cause us to lose hours of our life. Not only is the time spent worrying and in anxiety lost, but the toll it takes on our health is notable. Anxiety is not proactive. It's the opposite of that. Deactive? I don't know what the opposite of proactive is, but whatever it is, that's what anxiety is. They're trying to help me over here, but I can't hear them. Thank you, though. I bet you you're right. Tell me afterwards. Then Jesus provides another illustration, this time using flowers. In verse 27, he asks us to consider the lilies of the field. He points out how they do not work and they do not sew clothes together. Here it says they do not spin. They don't don't put their clothes together. But when you look at them, how much more beautiful are the lilies than Solomon in all of his glory? 
Think of the, the greatest kings, or, or in our context, the, the A-list celebrities. They are not dressed nearly as well as a lily. And yet they go through all of this rigmarole to try to do that. Without any worry, lilies are more glorious than the kings and rulers of this world. From lilies, Jesus uses an illustration of grass in verse 28. Some commentators think that he's referring to the lilies as grass here. I don't think that's what he's doing. I think he's moving to a new picture for us in grass. Jesus tells us God provides the grass with clothes. And they are here for a short while, and then they are thrown into the oven. If he closes them, if he gives them clothing, how much more will he give us clothing? Jesus concludes his thoughts here in verses 29 and 30 by once again telling us not to worry about what we will eat or what we will drink, because God knows what we need, and he cares for us. And not only does he take care of us, but he says he takes care of the nations. This is what theologians refer to as God's common grace. God, in his goodness and kindness, even provides for the people who do not love him, who do not seek him, who do not worship him. And if he provides for them, how much more is he going to provide for his kids? If my son has a friend over at the house and comes to me and says, Mr. Walker, can I, can I have a snack? And I say, sure, sure, buddy, what would you like? Oh, I'd like, I'd like a sandwich. And I, I made him up a sandwich. And then my son comes and says, Dad, can I have a sandwich? I'm hungry. Am I likely to say no to him when I just said yes to the neighbor kid? Of course not. I'm going to say, yes, son, what can I get for you as well? In a similar way, that's what... Jesus is saying here, God even cares for the pagan nations through his common grace. How much more is he going to care for each one of you? Instead of seeking after earthly treasure, Jesus tells us in verse 31, he tells us what we are to seek after. He says, we should seek the kingdom of God. We should seek heavenly treasure And when we seek the kingdom of God, when we seek heavenly treasure, he says, then the things that you need on earth will be provided for you. It's kind of like when you're you're not trying to get this done and you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, the rest of it's going to fall into place. The positive exhortation Jesus gives us, instead of worrying, instead of being anxious, is don't do that. Instead, seek the kingdom of God. Seek God's kingdom. The Greek construction used here by Luke suggests that this need to seek God's kingdom is continual. It's ongoing. This is not something that we do one time and say, okay, I've done that. I'm good. Let's move on to the next. No, we should continually be doing this. This should be a habit of our lives. It should be a habit of your life as a follower of Jesus. And in order to assuage any anxiety, you may still have in your heart as a believer, Jesus says in verse 32, you are not to fear because God's good pleasure is to give you his kingdom. If you've fallen asleep, if you've fallen off the tracks, come back because this is glorious. What a remarkable statement. God is pleased to give you everything he has. In Christ, God is pleased to give you, as Paul puts it in Ephesians, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Here he says he's pleased to give you his kingdom. We are called to seek God's kingdom, Jesus tells us. And in order to assure us, God is committed to willing to, he says here, even and especially, he is pleased to do it. He gives us his kingdom. In light of this, Jesus calls us to be a people who give in verse 33. 
We should give what we have and store our treasure in heaven where it's unable to be stolen. It's unable to rust. It's unable for moth to come in and destroy it. It is safe and secure for us in heaven. Look at verse 34. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You are loyal to the things you value most. Where you place your treasure, where your possessions are, where your money is, where your time is spent, where your talents are going, there is where your heart will be. So we've seen treasure on earth and treasure in heaven. As we conclude this morning, and as we seek to apply God's word here in Luke chapter 12 to our lives, how are we to live in light of what we have seen in God's word today? Well, there are two things I want to highlight for us this morning as our application. Two things to look at as we conclude briefly here this morning. First, application. Jesus is quite clear in our passage. You are to seek the kingdom of God. In fact, he explicitly says it in verse 31. I'm not making this up. There's no rabbit out of the hat tricks being done here. It's what Jesus says we are to do. You are to seek the kingdom of God. As believers, our time and energy is to be spent in seeking the things of God and not the things here on earth. We are to have our treasure in heaven, not here on earth. If our primary focus is on gaining earthly treasures and possessions, we will miss out on the kingdom of God. But Jesus tells us in verse 31, if we seek the kingdom of God, we will be given what we need here on earth. So how do we practically do this? How do we seek the kingdom of God? Well, one of the primary ways to do this, you'll be happy to know, you are already doing right now. You are here this morning worshiping the king of this kingdom. As you gather on the Lord's day for worship, as you gather with God's people, you are seeking the kingdom of God. As you notice when we prayed this morning, we prayed that God would give us a glimpse of his kingdom, that we would see it here in our worship. This morning you are seeking the kingdom of God. You are seeking God himself here in corporate worship. We are called by God to come into his presence through the call to worship. And then we spend our time together confessing our sins, declaring our utter need and dependence upon God, singing praises to our king and hearing from him. And then we are sent out into the world to be a light shining into the darkness. This is how we seek his kingdom. We come to be with his people, and together we seek the king of glory. Further, we seek the kingdom of God in our own lives. When we seek to know our God better, when we seek to have a deeper understanding of who he is. So we, we do it corporately, and we can also do it individually. How do we do this individually? Two simple things come to mind. First and primarily, we learn about our God. We seek his kingdom as we read his word. Do you read God's word? Are you daily reading your scriptures? Are you worshiping together as a family, opening God's word together and reading it? We learn about our God as we read his word. Through reading his word, the Holy Spirit applies this word his word to our hearts and to our lives and gives us great insight into who our God is. It helps us to seek the king of the kingdom. Second, not only when we read scripture, but when we also study theology. After all, what is theology but the study of God? It's learning more about God. In order to gain a deeper insight into our God, do we read works of theology? Do we read works about 
the Bible? Do we seek out those who know more about this than us and see what they have to say? When you read great works of theology by fellow believers who have read God's word and explain it in ways that you are able to understand and grow, you are seeking the kingdom of God. And the reason that seeking this kingdom is so important that Jesus tells us is because apart from this, we're lost. Apart from this kingdom, we are out in the barren wilderness, in the desert, on our own. Because apart from this king and this kingdom, we are sinners left to our own way. We have sinned against the holy God. We have ran after the pleasures of this world. We have created idols for ourselves. We have loved the creation rather than the creator. But when we seek this kingdom, when we seek this king, the king who stepped off of his throne came into the world that was in rebellion against him. And that's not someone out there. That's someone right here. When we were in rebellion against God, he stepped off of his throne. He came down and he said, I've got this. I know what to do. I'm going to live the life that they should have lived. I'm going to not be anxious. I'm going to not be greedy. I'm going to care about them more than I care about myself. And he demonstrated this in the ultimate sacrifice by going to the cross and being crucified. Do you know where the word excruciating comes from? comes from the Greek word that we translate as crucifixion. What he did for us was excruciating. But he had the right priorities. He cared more about you than he did about stuff. He was offered all of it. Satan said to him, you can have all of it. Just bow down and worship me. That's all you got to do. You can have everything this world has to offer. I turned my back on God for a Big Mac. And he wouldn't do it for everything in creation. And instead, he didn't take the way full of pleasure. He took the way that led to pain, excruciating pain for you. He bore the punishment that you deserved. For the wages of sin is death. Because of your sin, you need to die and on sentencing day, God looks at you and says, guilty of death, go to the chamber. And Jesus comes running in and says, I'll do it. I'll go in his place. I'll go in her place. Let me do that, Father. And the Father says, okay. It's not only mind-blowing that Jesus would do it, but the Father says it's okay for his son to do it. This is why seeking this kingdom is so important because it reorients our priorities because we see the proper priorities demonstrated in us in the one who is perfect, the one who lived for us. And the second application this morning briefly is this. In light of this, in light of this kingdom ethic, in light of the way the kingdom works, we are to be the kind of people who give. In light of the fact that the king gave his only son for us, we are in light of that glorious truth called to give. Now, now don't mix up the order here. You don't give in order to be brought into the kingdom. You're brought into the kingdom as a son, as a daughter, because of what God has done and what God has done alone. But as a member of this kingdom, as a member of this family, God calls us to give for those who have been brought near to God our hearts have been changed our relationship to our possessions has been radically altered and we have been freed to give when we give we have been freed to do that we have been freed from greed from anxiety from from covetousness from from mine lord of the rings Gollum holding his ring, my precious. In Christ, we are freed from that and we are able to give, to give. 
One of the primary ways you can see a heart transformed by the gospel. If you want to ask yourself, Lord, Lord, how do I know that I'm following you? How do I know that I believe you? Do you have a heart that willingly, freely, gratefully gives to the work of God in his church? That's what Jesus is saying here. When you seek the kingdom, this is how you'll know. You are a person who gives. So as we look to Jesus, as we look to the model our Father has given us, who has given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, including and up to the death of his Son in our place, we are called in light of that, when we believe that, when that has gripped our heart, we are called to be a people who give. Let's pray. Our great God, we ask that this morning we would be a people that seek the kingdom of God. That individually we would seek your kingdom. Lord, we would seek to be part of the kingdom where the God of the universe gives his only son to die in my place. In my place. You know what I've done. And yet you still send your son to die for me. And you call me, son, come home. And you wash me clean. Lord, help us to seek that kingdom. For there's nothing this world has to offer that's better than that. For all we claim to know is that we have Christ and him crucified. Lord, in light of these glorious truths... Help us to be a people that gives to the work of your church. For Lord, we want to give so that others can hear the wonderful message of this kingdom. So that others can be told they need to seek this kingdom as well. Help us not to get distracted with the things of this world. Help us to remain focused in our calling to make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Spirit. Help us to keep our eyes squarely fixed upon Jesus and his kingdom. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.